when I left being a monk around five years ago. And when I left, it was like, oh my God, I'm in the real world now again, real world. I have to think about how to apply all this. I'm going to test for real all this stuff that I've learned. And I was scared, like I was nervous, I was anxious and all those things that I've been trained not to be rushed back because for the first time in my life, I had to really put it into practice. And I love that feeling. I'm so glad that I had to do that. So for me, actually, the mindset is completely trainable to bring into the real world. That's, that's what I'm trying to do. And, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to gain clarity and perspective when you need it. Because you know when you can just take a bird's eye view from something. You know when you need to get close into something. You know when you need to pull back from something. There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says that detachment is not that you own nothing. Detachment is that nothing owns you. And, and I love it because to me that summarizes detachment in a way that it's not usually explained. Usually people see detachment as being away from everything. Actually the greatest detachment is being close to everything and not letting it consume and own you. And that's real power, that's real strength. How many people do we know that have had fame and then that fame has ruined them? So for me, that definition of detachment is possible to practice even in the real world, rather than saying, oh, I'm just gonna have a really simple life. I'm just gonna have nothing in life. What was the best part about being a monk? The best part about being a monk is that your morning routine and practices are so powerful that you can actually aspire for more incredible values in life. Because your mind is clear. Because your mind is clear and you have that ability to have more clarity so you can seek that which is, which is higher. So I'll give an example of what I mean. Define, yeah. is that what you're about to define? Yeah. What is higher? Yes, exactly. So for me, being able to overcome ego, being able to overcome envy, being able to overcome jealousy, being able, able to overcome the negative of competitive state. There's a positive competitive state and there's a negative competitive state. Today, when people are looking on Instagram or Facebook or YouTube, all you're looking at is, oh, she got that many likes, or he got that many likes, she got engaged, or he got married, or, oh my God, look at her body, or look at that. And it's like, that stuff's destroying us inside. Envy, jealousy, ego, greed. To be able to have enough clarity to purify yourself of those things is gonna alleviate the biggest anxieties and depressions of our time and mental health problems. And, and we know that. We know that because all the mental health research today suggests that things like isolation, overexposure, we now can have more pain consumption in one day because of what we're exposed to than the pain we would have had in a lifetime. That's huge. Like that, that's ridiculous to think that in one day, because of the media, news and social media, we consume more negative than we did in a lifetime. For me, being able to have time energy and clarity to focus on self-purification that is the best thing about being a monk because you have that time reflection and a process and an environment that only allows you to become more purified of those things so if i was the interviewer that i wanted to be i would have asked you this question when we were on the topic but i'm going to go back just because yeah. it's important enough um, you gave us the three ways that you can really construct mm -hmm. your ideal life but define an ideal life for me. Mm -hmm. So in an ideal life for me is a life, and this applies to a company, an organization, an institution for me, is an ideal life is when we all have a head, a heart, and a hand, all three elements together, working in alignment. Without one or the other, we start to lose something. If you only have a head and a heart, you'll find that life is stable, and define yeah, each of those. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. So a head is the clarity of vision. What you want. What you want. Knowing what you want, the way you picture life, and being able to navigate and make the decisions to get there. That's a good head. A good heart is being able to understand what your intuition and heart wants. Being able to connect and tap into that understanding deeper and beyond the vision you may have painted for yourself. So I often say to people that you'll get to where you want in life, just not in the way you imagined. And that's because the path that's paved up and down is far different to the path we paved. So you can have a great head and a great vision and a great mission and know where you want to go, 
But if your heart's not able to have that resilience and be able to adapt and, and have compassion and care and all of that, then, then you're not going to be able to make the toughest decisions without your heart. But to be able to realize that we need to care and be sustainable and long-lasting requires a heart. And a hand is that service, wanting to pass that on, that which you have, wanting to give it forward, pay it forward. The idea of serving with what you have. I often say to people, your passion is for you, your purpose is for others. Your passion makes you happy. But when you use your passion to make a difference in someone else's life, that's a service, that's a purpose, and that's the hand. So those are my three elements of an ideal life. I like that a lot. And I, I, when you first said it, and I'm glad you defined it, because when you first said it, I thought the heart was going to be the part about like, you know, just compassion and caring for others, doing something for other people. Um, but I like that, the hand um, being tied to service. Mm. So one thing that I think a lot about is deep fulfillment. Like really, when I think about, okay, what is a life we're living? Honestly, it comes down to neurochemistry for mm -hmm. me. And it comes down to experiencing this world in a way that optimizes for for sustainable pleasure, which I'll differentiate between a bowl of ice cream, a bump of cocaine, those are pleasurable. Absolutely. And I, I haven't done the cocaine, but the ice cream I can speak for. Okay, I've done both. Good. <laughs> yeah. So I'll trust that it's, it holds up. Yeah. Um, but they, they don't bring a lasting fulfillment. It's not sustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So both of them end up creating this self-destructive loop. And purpose really does become that thing that gives you something that is on a neurochemical level, mm -hmm. deeply satisfying. Absolutely. And it, how much of this, like, how did you marry the deeply spiritual, the often abstract, oftentimes I'll hear spiritual speakers talk and, and I feel them sort of drifting off into the ether. How did you marry that to experimentation, neuroscience, practicality? Mm -hmm. Like. One, why do you find that interesting? And then two, what are you doing with that? So I studied behavioral science at university, so I've always been fascinated by why people do what they do. And whenever I was reading these books that are 5,000 years old, my greatest fascination was finding a principle and finding its relevance in modern science. And I said to myself, the day I can't find that, I'll quit. I won't believe in this anymore. So I'm still doing that and I'm ready to quit. If someone shows me a piece of science and I can't find a principle in these ancient literatures, or actually what I like to call these timeless literatures, then I'll give up my faith because for me, it has to track forward. And I'll give you a really basic example. Today we're in the gratitude movement. There's like a million gratitude journals out there. There's a million scientific studies on gratitude and gratitude has been linked to better mental health self-awareness, better relationships. I mean, there's so many scientific studies on the, on the neuro level that shows that gratitude is great for your mind, brain, and fulfillment. Now, I look back, like gratitude is all over the timeless wisdom. One of the first things we were trained to do when we were a monk was to pay our respects to the earth for what it gives us. And you do that first thing in the morning. What is that if not gratitude? When you wake up in the morning, you thank the earth for the food, you thank the earth for the water, you thank the earth for allowing yourself to walk. You start your day with gratitude. Today, the biggest tip on Forbes and Inc and everything is start your day with gratitude. Like, where does it come from? It's, it's right there. These things are old. So I, I get fascinated. I'm intrigued by the parallels and patterns because it saves you time. It's the same way as which if I say that this business person got invested by this company and that's why they're successful because they had the right investors, etc. That's a pattern. So I know if I'm building a business in that area, I'm gonna look for investors like that. It's the same thing, that pattern saves you time. Rather than you trying to figure out, does gratitude work? How shall I be grateful? Creating your own process almost. If you want even more videos like this one, click on the boxes over here. Now, I'm really excited to let you know that you can now pre-order my new book, Think Like a Monk, and you can click here right now to do that. Pre-order it today.